Hello everyone, my name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Dual sport motorcycles like this Honda CRF300L are still gaining in popularity with many newer or beginner riders looking at a dual sport bike as an entrance into the motorcycle field. The other type of rider that's looking at a dual sport bike might be a more experienced rider coming from perhaps a heavier adventure bike who's realized that adventure bikes are really too heavy to do off-roading very well and so they're looking at dual sport bikes like this. I think it would be fair to generally classify dual sport bikes into two broad categories. One would be the high performance racing dual sport bikes. These would be motorcycles like the KTM 500EXC, the Beta RRS, uh, even Honda's own CRF 450 RL. The second category would be affordable dual sports. These are going to be more around the five to seven thousand dollar range and includes bikes like this Honda CRF 300L, the DRZ 400, uh, the KLX 300 from Kawasaki, and on the heavier end, bikes like the venerable XR650R and Suzuki's DR650SE. I'm filming a video soon comparing these two different types of dual sports and trying to help you figure out what type of dual sport might be right for you. Because those more expensive race level bikes like the KTMs I mentioned, they require very frequent maintenance in addition to being very expensive to purchase up front, but you get amazing suspension, amazing handling, amazing power from the engine. Bikes like this here, you get a lot less power, a lot less suspension performance, but the maintenance is much less intensive and of course they're much more affordable to buy. This motorcycle here, Honda CRF 300L, coming in at a very reasonable $5,250 US base price, is one of the hottest new dual sports to come out recently. Based on the previous CRF 250L, which came out around 2013, this bike, which came out in 2021, saw heavy revisions. They bumped up the displacement on the engine, they dropped 11 pounds from the weight, they revised the chassis, the suspension, the instrumentation, and a lot of different things on the bike to bring it up to a more modern level. So the question is, how does this bike stack up against its closest competitors? Bikes like the KLX 300, which I've already reviewed, Suzuki's DRZ400S, which I'm reviewing next week, and I should have a video out on that in the next couple of weeks. But also, how does it compare to more expensive dual sports, and why might you choose this over those, or why might you not choose that over those more expensive bikes? Now don't worry, we're also gonna talk about the rally version of this bike. So this bike comes in the standard version here and the rally version, which of course has been made really famous because Norley Ichiboots is riding the rally version around the world. So here's how we're gonna break down this video and I'm breaking it into chapters. This is a bit of a long video because this is an in-depth review. That's how I do things here at Big Rock Moto. So we're gonna take you around on a tour of the bike, talk about some of the main specs and features. Then we're gonna get it out on the highway and the freeway, test out its high-speed capabilities. Then we're gonna get it in the dirt, of course, on the trail. Then we're gonna come back here and talk about how it compares to a lot of its competitors. Then I'm gonna answer all the questions that you sent in via Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And then finally, we'll have some final thoughts on this bike. So grab your favorite drink, grab some popcorn, and let's go for a ride. All right, let's give you a tour around the bike and talk about some of the specs and features real quick before we jump on and go for a ride. Let's talk about the engine first. So it's a 286cc single cylinder engine. This engine makes 27 horsepower and 19 foot-pounds of torque measured at the crank. Now I'll put the metric equivalent below here in the text as I do in all my videos. It's linked up to a six-speed transmission with a slipper clutch. It's pretty amazing to get a slipper clutch on a bike at this price point. So this bike, fully fueled up, weighs 310 pounds, and I'll put the kilogram conversion here below. It has a stated seat height of 34.7 inches, although, as I'll show you in a second, it feels lower than that because of how much the suspension squashes down when you sit on it. Looking at the fuel tank, you've got 2.1 gallons of fuel, uh, giving you a riding range of uh, around 100 to 120 miles, depending on how fast you're riding. Let's talk about the suspension. So we'll get into this more later, but it is a non-adjustable suspension for the most part. On the front, you have about 10 inches of travel here from this upside down fork. Looks really good with the gold color. 
In the rear, you have the same about 10 inches of travel. You can see in here, there's a preload adjuster, but it's a it's one of the uh, screw type adjusters. It's very difficult to do without taking the shock out of the bike, and it's not something you can do on the side of the road or quickly if you're going to load up a passenger for a ride you can't just quickly turn up the preload. There's no other adjustments on the suspension. Let's talk about the MSRP. So here in the US this bike comes in at $5,249 plus destination. If you want ABS it's another $300 so that would bring it up to $5,549. Let me give you a walk around of the bike, then we'll jump on board, take a look at the dashboard and some of the features of that. So you've got this kind of big pointy front fender here. The stock tires are Dunlop D605s, which are a good like 50-50 uh, tire, but they don't have a ton of grip off-road. But they're affordable and they work well on the street. Of course you've got reflectors here. If it was me I would take these off because they look a little bit silly. Uh, nice big fork guards here to protect the inverted fork. You can see the disc brake. I'll put the size of this disc here. I believe it's just a twin piston caliper and it's a smaller rotor. The, the brake is not very strong. We'll talk about that when we go for a ride. You can see the radiator here. You can see the plastic shrouds. We talked about the engine already. Uh, maintenance on this bike very easy. Oil filter is very easy to get to. Air filter is easy to get to, uh, you know, 3,000 mile oil change or however often you want to do it. But it's a street bike engine, it's not a race engine, so you don't have to do a ton of maintenance on this thing. So that's really, really good. You can see the frame here, the brake lever, the, uh, you know, this stuff does look a bit cheap, as you would expect at this price point. The pegs are not the worst I've seen, but they're definitely something that I would get a bigger foot peg if it was my personal bike. You can see the rear brake master cylinder here. The passenger foot peg, which is attached directly to the frame here, kind of an interesting design. A little bit of a shield there um, for the passenger's boot so it doesn't hit the exhaust. You've got this plastic exhaust shield here. You can see the shock linkage, the swing arm, the rear single piston Nissan caliper, uh, the rear tire. It's an 18-inch uh, rear wheel, which is great. And it comes with a 120-80 section uh, rear tire. Again, that Dunlop 605. Coming around to the back of the bike, you can see the exhaust, which has a pretty small outlet, and it looks like it's pretty heavy, so that would be one place you could save weight. It's also got this very large rear fender appendage, which um, flops around a lot and is definitely something that a lot of the owners are, you know, cutting off or replacing with more of a, of a tail tidy unit. You can see here the incandescent turn signals and the brake light. I'm going to grab the key because on this side of the bike, this is kind of an interesting feature. So you put the key in here and it unlocks and this is actually a locking place to keep tools and like your owner's manual, registration papers, uh, whatever you might want to keep in there and then that closes. Um, seems a little flimsy but I don't know, I guess it will hold up, time will tell, but it's kind of a handy feature to have. Uh, you can see the chain guard here. I like how they give you a sticker here with, you know, the recommended tire pressures and things like that and how to check the chain, ch chain tension there. <coughs> the side stand is kind of at a weird angle on this bike. It's very upright and so the bike leans over very far. doesn't feel super secure, so I'm not sure why exactly they did that. You can see the other side of the engine here, the shift lever, which you can adjust by changing the position on the shaft got some electrical connections, some water hoses, not too much else to report. So why don't we go ahead and jump on board this beast and see what we've got here with the controls. Okay, so when you jump aboard the CRF 300L, one of the first things you're going to notice is that although the bike seems very tall when you're looking at it, when you sit on it, it, squat, it goes through so I'm 190 pounds uh, on a good day, more like 195 pounds if we're honest. But it squashes through about half its suspension travel just with me sitting on the bike. So it actually feels pretty nice and low to the ground, which is a nice feeling to have, especially for newer riders. Let's look at the control layout. So it doesn't come with handguards. That's definitely something you'd want to do if you were going to use the bike as a dual sport. The mirrors are very nice and wide and effective there. Uh, but again, that'd be a place for potential aftermarket if you're going to use the bike off-road a lot. You've got nice, easy to use switch gear. It is a Honda, so they reverse the position of the horn and a turn signal. So every time I go to use my turn signals, I end up hitting the horn. I don't know why they do that. Um, Non-adjustable levers, and you wouldn't expect adjustable levers at this price point. You've got a push-pull throttle with the two cables. Um, does have hazard lights, which my 
expensive Norden 901 doesn't even have, so that's nice to see. You've got a starter button. One thing that I is stupid how they did this is this brake line, how they have it routed, it just blocks the dashboard. And I, I have no idea what, how that could get past their, their sort of quality control. Um, so I'm sure there's an easy way to like loosen this and route this differently, either up here or maybe shorten it. Or I'm just sticking it down through here. I don't want to loosen this banjo bolt because I'm worried about air getting in the system and it's a press bike, so I don't really want to have to deal with it. So I'm just kind of sticking it in here so I can see the dashboard. But that's a very weird thing going on. Speaking of the dashboard, I love the dashboard on this bike, and this really sets it apart from pretty much any other dual sport that I have ridden. They did a great job on this. So, what you have here is, starting in the upper left, you've got a clock, and you have a fuel gauge, which seems pretty accurate, and it's very nice to have a fuel gauge on a bike like this. You've got this tachometer, which goes up here across the screen, all the way to 12,000 RPM. Speedometer in the middle, and then you've got a trip computer and an info readout below that, and I'll show you some of the different um, readouts there. And you have a gear position indicator. How many bikes at this point, at this level, give you a gear position indicator? I really, really like that. So if I hit the select button, I go through uh, hours, uh, odometer, trip A and trip B. Now if I go back to trip A and then I hit set, I can go through different displays here. So now I can see how much fuel I've used, my average speed. This is tied to the trip meter A that I'm on. So on this 29 mile ride, I got 65 miles a gallon, used 0.4 gallons of gas, and I had an average speed of 28 miles per hour. I love the instrumentation here. It's very, very nice. So I think I'll probably fuel up before we go out for this ride because I'm going to be riding for a couple hours. So I probably should get gas. So I think that's about it. Uh, the handlebars are kind of a cheap steel handlebar, which you would expect. Nothing else really to worry about. Um, comfortable riding position. So why don't we get this thing out on the road? Okay, I think we're ready. Let's buckle up here and get this thing out on the highway. One of the first things you notice about this motorcycle is it's very quiet. Personally, I like that for a dual sport bike because I think it helps keep the trails open instead of getting more trails closed. One of the other things I notice about this motorcycle is that the uh, gearing, I really like the gearing. So uh, first gear is very, very short and I'll show you that on the trail. But I'm already in fourth gear at like 33 miles an hour. So it has a nice nice spread of gear ratios and makes the most of its power. Uh, the engine does not have a lot of vibration, but we're going to do a freeway test here in a minute. Uh, so let's talk about how it works on the back road, so, or how it works kind of driving around town. It's a very good motorcycle for riding on the street like below 60 miles an hour. And we'll get to the freeway in a minute and show you why it may not be like the best high speed tour. So for a dual sport bike, this feels very refined and very smooth and just very slick. Um, I don't hear a chain like rattling around. The engine doesn't sound like a box of gravel like most of the KTMs and even my Beta does. So kind of instills a lot of confidence sort of in the quality and the, maybe the reliability of the bike. So at 50 miles per hour in sixth gear, I'm at 5,000 RPM. If I drop to 5th gear, I'm at 6,000 RPM. 4th gear, uh, 50 miles an hour, 7,500 RPM. So if I start to turn up the pace a little bit here, it's a fun bike to ride on roads like this. No, no complaints about it, you'd have a lot of fun. You can use all the power because again, it only has 27 horsepower at the crank. You do start to feel some buzz through everything, through the seat, through the bars at around 8,000 RPM, but it's not too bad. Motorcycle corners very, very well, but also that's going to depend on what kind of tires you have on it. The stock tires are pretty good on the street. Let's talk about the brakes for a second. So let me do a stop from 55. Ooh, the brakes are, the brakes are soft. Um, that front brake is very, very, like it doesn't have much power there. Uh, even though this is only a 300 pound bike, yeah, it's, it's not, the brakes are not very good. So, I, you know, it is what it is there. It's not a 
uh, going to be a bike that stops super, super fast. It would be interesting to test the ABS version, but they don't seem to have that available for testing. So in riding this bike, I've had this bike for like over a month already, actually, before I started filming this review, and I've been surprised by, it, it feels like it has more torque and more power than the numbers would suggest. Like, uh, you know, I rode the KLX 300, I've spent a lot of time on DRZs and other bikes like the WR250R, which I owned. It just feels a bit more powerful, like it gets up to speed better, and the engine is very quiet, and um, it doesn't feel too busy and it just feels pretty relaxed even at like 60 miles an hour see right there i'm at 60. okay slight uphill zero to 60. Okay, let me try 0 to 60 again, slight downhill this time, and I'll try revving it out a little bit more. Let's do it. We're going to do a freeway test of the CRF300L. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. We have a slight headwind, which is a good real-world situation. I would say around 10 mile an hour, maybe gusting to 15 mile per hour headwind coming towards us, which is going to make maintaining our speed harder. Also going uphill a little bit, up the pass on this road. Also, the traffic where I live here in Southern California on the freeway typically travels around 75 to 90 miles per hour, which is pretty fast. And if you can't keep up, uh, it's uh, kind of dangerous, actually. Uh, and again, I weigh around 190 pounds. Obviously, the bike is stock. There's no luggage on it, and I'm riding by myself. So let's get going. guys can still hear me but I'm I've got the throttle pinned uh, fully open and it says I'm going 70 miles per hour I cannot accelerate past this let me try downshifting to fifth Okay, now I'm in fifth gear. Let's see what I can do. Okay, 72, 73. So I'm totally flogging the bike now. I'm doing 9,000 RPM and I'm holding about 75, but I'm pinned to wide open. If I shift to sixth, uh, yeah, it just depends how much wind is hitting me at the moment, but... So I can just barely keep up with traffic here. I'm wide open. I can't keep up with the Nissan Sentra in front of me. 74. 74. Wide open throttle. Downshift. doesn't really help so I cannot now I'm losing ground the bike doesn't have enough horsepower to travel at 75 miles per hour uh, with you know in real-world conditions I would say about 65 so if I slow down if I slow down to 65 that's a bit more reasonable but 65, see I'm getting passed on the right. So that's not gonna work. The vibrate, if you keep the RPMs under 7,000, the vibrations are actually in check. But when you go over 7,000 RPM, it does start to get 
pretty buzzy. Uh, so in sixth gear, your your RPM is your speed. So 70 miles an hour is 7,000 RPM. So it's easy to kind of keep track of that. Alright, time for the off-road test. So like I normally do, we'll go on this easy fire road, gentle road, see how it rides. Then we'll get it on a little bit rougher kind of two-track Jeep road. So let's go ahead and get this thing fired up. So because the bike doesn't have a lot of power, even if you big give the bike full gas, even like in a corner like this, it's really hard to get it to step out. So it's easy to ride and it's a good bike to learn on. You just feel that, you know, the suspension is so soft and compliant, which beginners will like and lighter weight riders will like. It's low to the ground, so you can always put a foot down. It's just friendly. It's like, yeah. It's just friendly and fun and playful. Uh, but it's also very soft as everybody has has talked about. So even on moderate speeds like this, on a trail that's not even that rough, I feel like I'm using almost all the suspension travel. But if you just want to putt around fire roads like this, and just explore the backcountry, then this is an amazing bike for that. And you don't need more. But if you want to, you know, charge the terrain and go, go off jumps and ride aggressively and ride through the desert, stuff like that, then of course it's, you know, it's not the bike for that. There, I got it sideways a little bit. <laughs> it's fun to do this. Whoa. <laughs> It's easy to slide around just because it's so small. These Dunlop 605 tires don't have a lot of grip, so you can break traction if you try. Oh, my poor GoPro here. It's getting all beat up. This is fun. Very, very enjoyable little bike to ride. But if you're heavier, it's going to be a real problem. This will show when I get onto the stiffer trail in a minute. Wee! Okay, now let's get it on my favorite little two-track here. See how it is in a rougher terrain. And you can expect the suspension. I mean, look, I can almost bottom it out just sitting on it, so. And there's a bottom already. Oh, this is gonna hurt. Ow, that bottomed out. I would love to ride this bike with proper suspension. I think it would be really, really nice because it has enough power for the trail. And I like the chassis and I like the engine. I like the transmission, but my God, it is almost unrideable. Ow. Like I am not riding fast and I'm, ow, ow, ow. And I know you're going to tell me, oh, stand up. Yeah, I know stand up. I know that. I'm not an idiot. But listen, for filming, I like to sit down because it gives a better view of the dashboard. But even if I stand up and ride, the suspension is still ungodly soft. And, whoa lost the back end there the uh see so bottomed again there standing up
You can keep the bike in third gear and put around, it has enough torque. That's where it sets itself apart from kind of the older 250s. It's pretty, ooh, pretty rutted there. I don't know why I always get into the ruts. Okay, so what else can we talk about? Uh, the clutch pull is very, very soft. Clutch engagement feels a little weird, but it's fine. But uh, I like the easy pull clutch. Your hand won't get tired. Throttle response is very, very gentle. So that's good. That's good. Ooh, almost crashed. The uh, I have to realize I'm not on knobby tires. Um, just don't have a lot of grip on these like loose leaves and stuff. I think this bike would be wonderful with proper suspension, like really wonderful. And the back, the rear shock is the worst part. The, the front is, is soft, but the, the rear is the part that just is, is horrendous. I mean, I can ride this trail faster on an adventure bike just because of how overly soft the suspension is on this bike that I'm worried about just bottoming and just getting thrown off. But it's playful and joyful. Oh, high coil. Like, you know, doing stuff like that. hazards of the job I just hyper extended my leg muscle when I tried to catch the bike in that slide there and really hurt my leg so I'm gonna have to nurse this thing back home and uh, just take it easy but man my leg is really messed up so yeah that's the hazards of the job but uh, I think we've kind of covered uh, how the bike works off-road it's really fun except the suspension is is way too soft which you know if you've watched any other video about this bike. Um, so let's uh, get home, get the ice pack started and the uh, ibuprofen, and then hopefully uh, I can record the rest of this review and get this thing done. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed the riding segments. Now let's talk about how this bike stacks up against anything you might be comparing it to. Uh, why don't we start with comparing it to the predecessor to this bike, Honda CRF 250L, which came out around 2013. So when Honda introduced the upgraded 300L, they changed quite a bit. Most obviously, they bumped the displacement by around 36 cc, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it gave the bike around three more horsepower and around three more foot-pounds of torque. That may also sound like not very much, but you have to consider that you're only talking in the mid-20s to start with in terms of horsepower and under 20 foot-pounds of torque. So a bump of three is actually a pretty significant increase. They also revised a lot of things with the suspension and the chassis and the bodywork and the instruments and, and other changes to transmission and now it's a slipper clutch. So if you can afford to get the newer 300 versus buying a used 250, I think you're gonna be well served by getting the 300 over the previous model. Now, how does this compare to the Rally model? So Honda sells a CRF 300 Rally, and the difference between the two bikes is essentially, this is a stripped down, more normal dual sport, and the Rally is more of a long distance travel bike. So what the Rally offers you is a much larger fuel tank. It goes up to a 3.4 gallon fuel tank. It gives you a pretty decent windshield and fairing setup. It adds also some lower body work as well. The seat on the Rally is also a little bit taller, plus the Rally version adds about 25 pounds to the weight of the bike. So many of you have asked me to compare this to the Kawasaki KLX 300, which I reviewed last summer, which was an upgrade from the old KLX 250. I really liked the KLX 300 and I talked about why in my review. Here's how this breaks down. So it should be kind of obvious by now, but I think the Honda looks way, way better than the Kawasaki. The Kawasaki looks very dated. The other things I like better about the Honda, the fit and finish is better. The build quality is a little bit better. 
Uh, the instrumentation is far superior on this bike as compared to the Kawasaki. So really good job with the instrumentation that Honda did here with the CRF. Comparing the engines and the power, they're very similar with sort of how much power they make. However, subjectively, I will tell you that the Honda feels like it's just a bit smoother and a bit more refined and a little bit less buzzy. So it just feels like a more modern engine to me, if that makes any sense. There's two other big differences that might be the most important. One is the cost. So the Honda costs about $500 less than the Kawasaki as a base price. However, suspension is a huge, huge difference here. Uh, we've already talked about it a bit uh, in the riding segment, but the suspension on this bike is incredibly, incredibly undersprung and underdamped and is inadequate for riders of an average weight riding at an average pace off-road. However, the Kawasaki suspension is decent. Uh, for a bike at that price point, uh, it's actually pretty good and has quite a bit of adjustment. So I think the $500 is well worth it on the Kawasaki if suspension is important to you out of the box. Personally, I prefer this bike overall to the Kawasaki because I really like the way it looks and that's important to me. I like the dashboard, I like the fit and finish, I like the engine better. So I would buy this bike, especially since it's a little bit less money, and then upgrade the suspension. But just beware that when you do that, you're probably gonna end up spending quite a bit more than if you had just bought the KLX. All right, so what if you're trying to choose between this bike and Suzuki's DRZ400S, which is seems to have been out since forever. I think it, that bike came out around 2001 or so. I was still in high school at that point. That's crazy to think about that. So I actually have the DRZ for testing right now. Suzuki's lending me one uh, to do a review on. So let me run through the differences. Uh, first of all, the DRZ has a lot more power and torque. It's a larger engine. Uh, so you're looking at a substantially faster motorcycle. Um, so that's something that could be a big factor for a lot of you. The suspension on the DRZ is vastly, vastly superior to this. The DRZ suspension is actually very, very good. It's a little bit soft for riding really fast, but it's very compliant and has really good adjustments and can suit a lot of riders around, you know, 175 to 200 pounds, whereas this is just wholly inadequate for that. The DRZ is a much taller motorcycle. The seat height on the DRZ is somewhere around 37 inches. And I noticed that when I jumped off of this and onto the DRZ that I have right now, the DRZ is so much higher. So if you're anything like under five foot 10, the DRZ is gonna feel like a skyscraper to you. And this bike, especially because it sinks a lot with the soft suspension, is gonna be much better for shorter riders. Couple more big things about the DRZ. The DRZ uses a carburetor, so it doesn't start as smoothly, it doesn't run as smoothly when you change altitudes or change temperatures and things like that. The carburetors have a tendency to get clogged up if you let the fuel sit in them, and I much prefer having the fuel injection on this bike. Another big downside of the DRZ is it uses a close ratio five-speed transmission. And it's a huge complaint of everybody who's owned the DRZs, and I've owned DRZs myself, if I haven't mentioned that already. Uh, what happens on a DRZ is you try to get on the highway or the freeway, and it feels like the motorcycle, the engine's just gonna blow up. It's revving so high, it just needs more gears. So essentially, to try to summarize this, if you're a tall enough rider and you're a more aggressive rider who wants to push harder, you're gonna appreciate that better suspension, the better ground clearance, uh, the more performance from the engine, then you should look at maybe considering the DRZ if the five speed and if the, if the lack of fuel injection is not a deal breaker for you, um, as it kind of is for me, especially in 2022. All right, so I put out there, I asked for questions on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube about the bike. So let's cover your questions now. Now, right off the bat, I cannot answer every single question. I received something like 150 different questions. I've tried to break down the ones uh, that were not covered in other parts of this review, and I've tried to combine ones that were similar in nature. So if your question is enlisted here, please don't feel bad. And if the stuff I don't answer, put that down below and I'll get to it in the comments. Just give me a few days as I do have a lot of uh, comments to go through on my channel. So number one, there were a lot of questions about how this compares to the Kawasaki KLX 300. I've already covered that in the last segment, so we're not gonna go into that again. Okay, next topic. A number of people asked, uh, they were shopping between this and a KLR 650. That's kind of an apples and oranges comparison. Although I suppose I could see why you might be cross shopping. The KLR is a larger, heavier motorcycle that's better uh, for highway travel. It, it can travel at 75, 80 miles an hour with a relative ease and it's not too much vibration. Uh, the KLR is better at hauling a lot of weight. It's better if you're a heavier, larger rider. 
Uh, it's more comfortable over long distance, it has wind protection, a big gas tank. It's more of an adventure touring bike, whereas this is more of like a stripped down dual sport bike. So very different uh, ways that you would really use the motorcycle. So I had a lot of questions about the suspension of the bike. Is it as soft as some of the other reviewers and other owners have said? Yes, it is. Unfortunately, uh, from the minute I got on this bike, I could tell there was something wrong with the suspension and it's just incredibly undersprung and underdamped. We don't need to beat a dead horse. So now I'm gonna get into some, some of the more specific questions. So got to roll says, uh, what mods would you do for four service road riding for a 240 pound rider? So uh, I always, you know, wanna look at motorcycle protection. So things like hand guards, a skid plate, uh, maybe a better seat, different tires. You're definitely gonna have to change the suspension at your weight. I mean, anybody over 120 pounds, which is pretty much everybody who's gonna buy this, is gonna to have to change the suspension. Seco23 says, are there other seats available? So I don't think that Honda sells other seats for the bike, although I could be wrong. But in the aftermarket, you have companies like Seat Concepts that have seats for every bike. So low seats, tall seats, comfort seats, whatever you want. So check out Seat Concepts if you're interested in other types of seats. Sam Ora says, when is someone too tall or heavy for this motorcycle? So we've talked about the weight as it goes with the suspension. Pretty much anybody, if you're gonna ride much off road, you're gonna have to upgrade the suspension. Height is not as big of an issue. So dual sport and adventure bikes are pretty tall. They have pretty good ergonomics. So it, you know, even if you're six foot, six foot two, maybe you put some bar risers, maybe you get some lower pegs, which I would do for myself anyway, if I bought one of these. But no, I wouldn't worry about the height and the weight is just gonna come into play with the suspension. So Pesto's got a posse says, uh, 300L for $6,500 or 250L used for $4,500, which do you buy? Uh, it's a $2,000 difference in price in your situation. I'd probably get the 250 and then do some nice modifications to it and just save the money. DW Morrissey says, uh, excessive engine heat and are there frame paint issues? So I would say yes to both. There is quite a bit of heat that comes off the right uh, side, the radiators on the right side. I was noticing on my ride yesterday, my leg was getting pretty hot. It was like 85 degrees outside. So yeah, it does seem to be quite a bit of engine heat for such a small motor. Uh, the frame paint issues you can see on this bike and I'll show here in the footage. Yeah, some of the paint is already wearing off and this bike only has like 400 miles on it. Darren Wynn says, 130 pounds rider, is the suspension okay for me? It might be. You might be the size where it's not too bad. If you're not gonna ride real aggressively and real fast, then it might be okay for 130 pounds. So Monokasi Moto, it's kind of a weird username. He says, uh, can this hold highway speeds with a rider and luggage for how long? So I covered that when I rode on the freeway. Uh, it depends on what highway speeds mean to you. The limit with this bike, especially if you have luggage on it, is gonna be around 65 miles per hour. I think that's around 105, 110 kilometers per hour. That would be the limit that you'd wanna do for any length of time. So Rebel Canuck says, uh, the cable in front of the dashboard. Yeah, it's a problem. It needs to be rerouted or replaced. Um, did Norley choose the right bike for around the world with some mods? I think so. I think so, especially for her size and weight, but for those of us bigger guys, around 200 pounds, you might want something with a bit more power, a bit more torque. He also says, what is the best thing and the worst thing about this bike? Uh, for me, the best thing is how much fun you can have and how much exploring you can do for five grand. I think that's really, really good. The worst thing we've talked about at length is just the suspension is super, super soft. Less Death 69 says, compared to WR250R, yeah, so I don't think we cover that in the comparison section. So I've owned a WR250R. Here's how that breaks down. The Yamaha, which is discontinued actually, has a much better suspension than this. It has around the same horsepower, but it has a little bit less torque. Overall, I'd prefer this engine. This motorcycle, like I like the dashboard a lot better. Uh, I like the engine better. So I'd be more inclined to get this and do a bunch of upgrades to it. But that WRR was a legendary bike and it's still a very, very valid choice. I just think this engine has a little bit more torque and that's something I like. Alpha Golf Alpha says, what's the minimum rider height? So because of how much it sinks down with the suspension, I mean, the, the seat height that they list is 34 and a half. So I think, any, I think you need to be around, 
at least like five foot six maybe to comfortably ride this, but it depends. Some riders are comfortable just putting one tippy toe on the ground. Other riders want to be flat footed. It's very, very subjective, but I would say if you're under like five foot five and I'll put the centimeters here, that's going to be a little bit challenging. So there were some other questions. Uh, one question was about seat comfort. I got that repeatedly. The seat comfort is above average for a dual sport bike. I was good for like a couple hours on the bike, but it's not a seat that I'd want to ride on all day long, but that's a very personal thing. I got some other questions about what kind of luggage would be good for this bike. So I would definitely be looking to save weight and not go with the racks and the extra width of the panniers on the racks. So I'd probably go with something like the Tusk Highland, which I feature in some of my other videos, or something like a Moscow Moto Reckless if you prefer that brand. Uh, but I think rackless luggage would, would be really good. And I know that's what Norley's using as well. Final thoughts on Honda's CRF 300L. When I'm thinking of the ingredients that would make for my perfect dual sport bike, if I could build a bike with everything I wanted, it would have a long maintenance interval. It would have a low seat height so I could touch the ground. It would have plenty of power and torque. It would have a comfortable seat, it would have some wind protection, it would have a large fuel tank, six gears, fuel injection, and it wouldn't cost a fortune. However, that motorcycle does not exist and probably never will exist. So when we're making a choice for a dual sport bike, we simply have to pick what set of compromises do you want? Do you wanna buy a bike like I own, a Beta 500 RRS, which is very expensive, 11 to $12,000, and requires a ton of maintenance? 500 mile oil changes, 1,000 mile valve inspections. You have to choose between a bike like that or a bike like this, which doesn't have enough power, has extremely soft suspension, but it's probably never gonna break because it's a Honda and you only have to change oil every 3,000 miles and valve checks probably never. This is an amazing little dual sport bike and it's gonna make a lot of riders very happy. It'll make beginners riders happy because it's easy to ride and it's affordable. And it'll make some more experienced riders happy because it's a good platform to put some mods on. You could do backcountry discovery routes on it, but just don't expect that you're gonna be able to load it up with luggage and go down the freeway at 75, 80 miles an hour and still tackle the trails. It's not that kind of motorcycle. And if you want a bike with that range of capability, you're gonna to have to look somewhere else. At just over $5,200 US, this is one of the best new motorcycles on sale today and represents probably the most fun and most exploration capability you can get for around this amount of money. I sincerely hope this review was useful and detailed and informative. And if it was, please support what I'm doing here at Big Rock Moto. And there's a lot of ways you can support the channel in the description and the comments below. Other than that, please ride safe and we'll see you out there. God dang it. By the way, it's an amazing motorcycle and one that... Hello everyone, my name is Ian, you're watching... So the big question is, why would you choose this Honda or why might you not? Uh, some people are... Oh, I really screwed up my leg. Oh, that's gonna suck. It's really going to suck. Ow, 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 ow.